Next, I'll talk about three people who helped to usher in the understanding of the world that we have today, and specifically the understanding of the solar system that we have today. The first of these people is Tycho Brahe, B-R-A-H-E, and the second guy here is Johannes Kepler. That's K-E-P-L-E-R. And then over here, this is Isaac Newton. And Newton, more than anyone else, is responsible for the modern understanding of the world. But we'll look at these people one at a time. Okay, first, Tycho Brahe. This guy was an astronomer. He was from Denmark. And he became interested in astronomy after seeing an eclipse. He also saw a super, he, he was fascinated by the fact that the eclipse had been predicted. And he also saw a supernova explosion and studied astronomy in college in Denmark at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And, um, and he was very dismayed by the fact that there were all these different measurements and charts of the stars from different astronomers and that none of them matched up with each other. And he realized that, that none of them could be accurate because they all were in disagreement. And he realized that what was needed was a long-term project to observe the positions of the stars and planets in the night sky and, and just to, to get some accurate data of where everything is. And that was his big contribution. He studied for years and years and years and charted the positions of the planets in the night sky. So he produced data, in other words, that was used by Kepler after him. He came up with new instruments for uh, accurately measuring the positions and recording the positions at various times. And every night that it was clear for uh, probably 20 years, he stayed up and observed the planets and the stars. Now he had this massive amount of data and the person who came after him, Johannes Kepler, did not get along well with, uh, with Brahe. And Brahe did not let Kepler have access to all of this data. And it wasn't until Brahe died and Kepler was able to convince Brahe's family to let him see and use all the data that he had collected. And Kepler eventually got access to that and was able to use that to produce a correct theory. Now Kepler was in, in Germany. He was teaching at a university there. He was a math professor and brilliant at the mathematics. Really, really had some good mathematical ideas. But was also extremely interested in and at times extremely preoccupied by astronomical theory. And he was trying to work out the, the, the shape of the planetary orbits. And the Copernican idea, Copernic, Copernicus and Galileo had both believed that the planets orbit the sun in perfect circles. But Kepler knew from the observations that the positions of the planets in the sky didn't quite match the theory of circular orbits. So he was trying to figure out what shape the planetary orbits took. And at first, he was following these very ancient ideas that go back to, go back to the, the three-dimensional solid figures, what we would call the platonic solids. If you imagine, for example, a tetrahedron, which is like a, a pyramid with a triangular base, and a cube, say we have a cube around this tetrahedron, and, and so on. You could have an, an eight-sided figure, and he was imagining these solids nested within each other and he would build these complicated models and he would think okay maybe maybe one planet is following a curve based on the corner of that solid as it would rotate and another planet is following a curve as it would as the cube would rotate and he was trying to trying to produce a theory of the positions of the planetary orbits based on these these solid shapes nested within each other and that was all wrong but, but it harkens all the way back to the ancient Greek ideas and the, the Pythagorean beliefs that there was some mystical power to these particular shapes. Kepler was able to break away from those ancient ideas, just like Galileo was able to break away from the Aristotelian view. Kepler was able to break away from the ancient views too. It took him a long time, and he was almost at the point of despair. He became very close to giving up on his, his uh, quest to understand the planetary orbits. But uh, finally, at one point, he tried the mathematical shape of an ellipse. An ellipse is what we think of as an oval. And you, you think of it as a, kind of an elongated circle. And there's two points in an ellipse. Each one is called a focus, or the plural is foci. The two, and you can pronounce it foci or foci. But the, the, the two foci of the ellipse, almost like a circle with two centers. 
and he realized that the, the planetary orbits matched an ellipse with the sun at one focus. So we'll scratch one of these out and just imagine the sun over here and then the planet orbiting the sun in this elliptical path. And that turned out to match the data precisely. And at that point he had found it. The shape of the planetary orbits was mathematically an ellipse. Now the ellipses are pretty close to circular. circular. You can have an ellipse that is very elongated or not very elongated at all. And the planetary orbits are ellipses but they're not very far off from being circular so it was difficult it was difficult to tell that they weren't circular but he was able to figure it out and this was a phenomenally difficult thing to do if you think about all of these uh, orbits for example let me draw a few of them let's say and again these are exaggerated but say here's a planet orbiting the Sun there and let's say another one here and what he had was data about where a planet was in the night sky. So say here's Earth and here's Mars and we look and we see Mars and it appears at a certain position relative to the background stars that are way way out here far away. Well the kind of data that Kepler had was Mars on such and such a day at such and such a time appears at such and such a position in the sky and all of this data about Mars orbiting the Sun was all taken from the point of view of Earth which itself is spinning and orbiting the Sun and that greatly complicates things and it makes it incredibly difficult to piece it all together he didn't have diagrams like this showing these lines where the planets follow he just had positions numerical data of the position of the planets in the sky and for him to put all that together and and actually figure out that it was an elliptical orbit was really an amazing thing and in fact Albert Einstein wrote this really nice little essay praising Kepler for actually figuring this out and being able to accomplish this from this point of view of the earth and able to actually correctly discern the shape of the planetary orbits and Kepler himself was ecstatic that he had done it and his um his explanation of the solar system was simple and elegant it made sense and it perfectly matched the data and the way he put it was that for six thousand years God had waited for someone else to look upon this with understanding and the six thousand years reference was reference to the calculation done by Bishop Usher back in the Middle Ages. Usher had looked at the dates in the Bible and had calculated the age of the universe to be about 6,000 years. And that that is not certainly widely accepted today. The, the prevailing view today is that the, the universe is much older than that. But at the time, the belief was the universe was about 6,000 years old. And Kepler said, for 6,000 years, God had waited for somebody to look upon this with understanding. And now here we are, able to see this and know correctly the the system of the world here how the solar system actually is and he produced his laws of planetary motion sometimes known as Kepler's laws or Kepler's laws of planetary motion and the first the first law was that the planets orbit the Sun in an elliptical path with the Sun at one focus of the ellipse and Kepler produced other laws of planetary motion as well describing more details about the motion how fast they move how far they move and the, the radius of the planetary orbits and the time that it takes them to orbit he produced three three laws Kepler's three laws of planetary motion the the point to know is that Kepler got it right and he got it right based on the data his laws were empirically produced and that means they were produced based on the data on the observations the actual measurements taken in the real world now next we'll talk about Isaac Newton and we'll see that Isaac Newton also produced laws describing the motions of the planets but Newton approached it in a completely different fashion but produced ideas that were exactly consistent with Kepler's theories so Newton will be the subject of the next video.